Hi. Today's history story is from Princesses Behaving Badly, and it is about Wu Zaitan, the princess who became emperor of China. She was born February 17, 624, and she died December 16, 705. Wu Zetan had, quote, a heart like a serpent and a nature like that of a wolf, favored evil sycophants and destroyed good and loyal officials, and killed her sister, butchered her elder brothers, murdered the ruler, poisoned her mother. She is hated by gods and men alike, end quote. Or so people said. Teasing out the real story from the tangle of official histories, which tend to be heavily weighted against female rulers, is tricky. In these accounts, she comes off as sadistic, cruel, and power-hungry. But she managed to accomplish what no other woman did in the 3,000-year history of imperial China, rule in her own right that she had to kill a few people to do it, including, allegedly, her own weak old daughter, was the price of power. If true, that is the kind of evil even a horror movie franchise wouldn't touch. But though Wu did have a murderous Machiavellian before Machiavelli streak, it is also true that her demonization by historians was fueled by a lot of false propaganda. Many thought Wu disrupted the Confucian order of things just by being a woman, and even more so by first ruling through her husband and then usurping the throne from her own sons. Folks didn't look too kindly on such behavior and if you're going to write a cautionary tale, why not throw in all the infanticide and grisly murder you can? To understand how Wu came to power and why she did what she did, you have to understand that Tang Dynasty China was a viper pit. A glorious viper pit, the height of Chinese ancient civilization a golden age of poetry and legal enlightenment and all sorts of great stuff, but a viper pit nonetheless. Inconvenient people were invited to commit suicide and often helped along if they failed to comply. Murder, especially among relatives, wasn't uncommon. Even more often, citizens brought false charges against political rivals in the hopes their enemies would be executed. If some historical texts are to be believed, the palace halls must have run red with blood of the executed, the assassinated, and the conveniently suicidal. Before she was slaughtering rivals, Wu was the daughter of a governor and a lady. She was a princess, but just barely. And though as a teenager she was a concubine in the imperial household, she was really little more than a maid, chiefly employed to change the emperor's bed linens. Though Wu appears to have been endowed with remarkable physical beauty as well as intelligence, such attributes would not have been enough to get her into the royal bed she turned down so faithfully. Still, Emperor Taizong did notice her, calling her his fair flatterer after a popular song. Taizong's death in 649 seems to have led directly to Wu hooking up with his son, Gaozong, who had also taken a shine to the concubine princess. According to the official dynastic history, Gaozong first noticed Wu, now in her twenties, when she was nursing his sick father on his deathbed. 
Other reports claimed that Wu offered Gao Zong a bowl of water to wash his hands after he went to the bathroom. When he inadvertently flicked water in her face, marring her white makeup, she said, I accept heaven's favor of rain and mist. Apparently, a naughty poetic reference. However they met, the two were definitely intimate before the old emperor was dead. In true Tang imperial fashion, Gao Zong's way to the throne was cleared by the fortuitous deaths and executions of four of his brothers. Confucian law declared that relations between a son and his father's concubine constituted incest, so Wu and Gao Zong's budding relationship was kept secret. Moreover, custom dictated that after the emperor's death, Wu had to shave her head and be committed to a convent, although she spent only a few months sequestered and didn't cut off her hair. Evidently, Gao Zong liked her enough to knock her up and then spring her from the nunnery to serve as one of his concubines. Wu soon became the emperor's favorite through a combination of sexy, insect-inspired eyebrows, duplicitous cunning, and near-constant pregnancy. One contemporary wrote, quote, Lady Wu, with her lovely eyebrows arched like the antenna of a butterfly, yields to no woman, but coyly hides her face behind her long sleeves and applies herself to slandering others, knowing her vixen charms hold the power to bewitch the emperor." End quote. Meanwhile, in her first five years in Gaozong's harem, Wu produced three, possibly four, children. And there is nothing so appealing to an emperor as fertility. It was around this time that Wu supposedly smothered her own child, and did away with her rivals in a remarkably grisly fashion. The infanticide is probably untrue, given Wu's later reluctance to harm her own children directly. Exile was her preferred method for dealing with disobedient offspring. It's quite likely the baby died of natural causes, and Wu took the opportunity to blame her rival for the death. Either way, that wasn't what brought down Empress Wang. It was her inability to produce a male heir. Ultimately, Gao Zong, likely prompted by Wu, claimed that his wife, along with his second favorite concubine, was plotting to poison him. Sentencing them both to prison was the perfect pretext for making room for baby-making Wu. Wu and Gao Zong appeared to have ruled jointly, although some historians claim she was the real power. By 660, she was a fixture in the throne room, observing all of her husband's audiences and offering advice and pronouncements from behind a screen. After Gao Zong suffered a series of strokes that left him blind and unable to walk or speak, Wu assumed his official duties, and the screen was taken down. Upon Gao Zong's death in 863, Wu became Empress Dowager, a title that usually indicates it's time to leave the stage. But Wu's final act was yet to come. With her son nominally on the throne, after, it should be noted, the death of his two older brothers, at least one of which was indirectly ascribed to Wu, Wu now held the real power. And when this son proved to be less malleable than she had hoped, she exiled him to a distant province and replaced with another son. Not for nothing did she also have the word Chinese, the Chinese word prince changed up changed to be made up of the characters, meaning one who keeps a peaceful mouth. Four years after Gao Zong's death, Wu was done trying to rule through her sons. 
After a carefully cultivated campaign of prophecy, public relations, and propaganda, she declared herself Sage Mother, Holy Sovereign, giving herself extraordinary power. But even that wasn't enough. Three years later, in 690, she shrugged off the Sage Mother mantle and declared herself Emperor. Wu ruled through a combination of public relations shrewdness and secret police terror. By declaring herself emperor, she effectively ended the Tang dynasty and started her own, the Zhao, angering the remaining imperial family members. To silence her critics, she had them all exiled or executed. She had always relied heavily on informants creating an atmosphere of distrust and fear. She'd had copper suggestion boxes posted in cities, allowing people to anonymously report information on rivals and invited anyone with useful information to travel to the palace on her dime. The fruits of that information could be deadly. Between 684 and 693, Wu went through 46 chief ministers, half of whom were murdered or committed suicide. After outliving his usefulness, her supposed lover, the Rasputin-like leader of a Buddhist cult, was beaten to death on her command. Even her own relatives lived in mortal fear they'd become inconvenient. According to Chinese chroniclers in later centuries, Wu was also free with her sexual favors, supposedly forming her own male harem at the advanced age of 66. Take all that with a big grain of salt, though. The easiest way to slander a woman in any era is to call her a slut. But Wu also ruled effectively, benignly, and even wisely over a nation of 50 million her subjects didn't see her as a dangerous monster or a tyrant. She united the kingdom at a time when it appeared to be disintegrating. Not only did she manage to keep the empire together and end the predations of the Tartars, who were ripping apart the northern border, she also expanded its territory, doing so with remarkably few wars. Under Wu, as both empress and emperor, Taxes decreased, financial waste, and military expenditure were reduced, retirees got pensions, and salaries of deserving officials rose. She introduced the system of entrance exams for bureaucratic service, a huge step toward meritocracy and away from nepotism. She passed legislation allowing children to mourn the death of both parents not just the father, as had been the custom and law. Under her rule, Chinese generals helped Korea oust their Japanese overlords and unite under a new king. The Japanese were so impressed that they started copying everything the Tang did, right down to building their capital city in an imitation of China's capital. Wu ruled for 15 years as emperor, before anyone got up the nerve and resources to challenge her. In 1705, a faction of Tang loyalists, headed by Wu's exiled son, suggested that it was time for her to abdicate the throne. When Wu didn't take the hint, a knife was held to her throat and she was forced to retire. Wu died later that year, of natural causes, surprisingly. After ruling ably and peacefully for the better part of 50 years, she had used the same tools as the em as emperors had for many a generation before her. Execution, banishment, terror. But such behavior had been deemed unbecoming of a woman, and Wu had gotten short shrift. How later rulers felt about Wu is clear by how they chose to remember, or in this case, not remember her. 
Chinese tradition at the time dictated that rulers be buried in sumptuous tombs marked with huge memorial tablets. Usually, the tablets were covered with details of all the great and glorious deeds the ruler had done and how he would be missed. Not so with Wu. Her tablet remained blank, a mute testament to women who accomplished much, but about whom no one had a good word to say. Empress Wu Zetan wasn't the only crafty woman in Imperial China. In 684, she had her son, Li Zhan, kicked off the throne and exiled to a remote outpost. He brought along his wife, Princess Wei, and lucky for him he did. If it weren't for Wei's constant goading and admonitions, Li Zhang probably would have committed suicide while in exile. It likely wasn't out of love for her husband that Wei talked him down. She simply was not about to let the chance to become empress pass by twice. When, in 705, the opportunity <coughs> finally came again, she seized it. A group of Tang family loyalists took Li Zhan as their leader and deposed Empress Wu. Li Zhan became Emperor Zhongzong, and he and his wife, Empress Wei, made their way back to the palace. Now sitting pretty on the throne, Empress Wei had an affair with Wu's nephew, Sansi, who was having an affair with the emperor's old private secretary. This wicked group made a fortune selling official posts, but the power still wasn't enough. Wei and Sansi, who by that time had been elevated to a high ministerial post, proposed that the imperial daughter Princess Anle, be named heir apparent. Not so fast, cried the legitimate crown prince, Li Shangjun, who marched on the palace, but was repelled after his own troops turned on their commanders. Despite the setback, Wei and Anle weren't cowed. Three years later, they finally pulled off their own coup, killing Emperor Zhao Zong with a poison cake and installing a more malleable son, Li Shang Mao, on the throne. Inspired by Wu, they planned to rule through him while preparing to install Anli on the throne as China's second female emperor. Unfortunately for them, Wu Zetan's daughter, Princess Taiping, got wind of the plan first and went to battle on behalf of her brother, Ruzong. But, as usual, things weren't exactly what they seemed. Rizong knew full well that his sister, Princess Taiping, was only biding her time until she could make her own attempt to steal the crown. So he got crafty. First, he named his son, Xuan Zhang, to be his successor and abdicated the throne. Then he had Xuan Zhang move on Taiping, based on the claim that she was about to try to dispose him. After several of her men were killed, Taiping fled to a Buddhist monastery where she was allowed to kill herself. The real surprise is that the Tang dynasty would continue for another 200 years. Shocking, given its members' murderous and suicidal tendencies to kill themselves and each other. Thanks for listening.